So it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and to have a chance to describe the experiments we are doing in Paris, uh, trying to manipulate and to observe and to manipulate particles of light. I like to uh, illustrate these experiments with this picture which shows uh, hands juggling with balls which are bouncing back and forth. In fact, the balls I am talking about in this talk are particles of light, photons, and they are, it's much more challenging to observe and to manipulate these particles of light than real balls because they are very fragile and it's very difficult to observe them without destroying them. In fact, when we do these experiments, we realize in the laboratory experiments which had been imagined by the founding fathers of quantum physics at the beginning of the 20th century. They were called at that time thought experiments, Gedanken experiments in German, because they were impossible to perform really in the lab. They were just imagined by people like Einstein, Bohr, and Schrodinger to illustrate the strange concepts of quantum physics. By doing now really these experiments in the lab, we illustrate indeed the strange laws to which the world obeys at the microscopic scale. I will be talking about the superposition principle, the fact that quantum particles can be at the same time in different states, so to speak, suspended between different classical states. An illustration of that is the famous Schrodinger cat, which Schrodinger imagined to be at the same time alive and dead. And of course, this is a metaphor because it does not happen in the macroscopic world, but it happens for a system made of small numbers of particles. And as the title of this talk says, I will try to shed some light on these strange states, not only to illustrate the fundamental laws of quantum physics, but maybe one day to develop possible applications which will use directly these strange laws to compute, to communicate, or to measure things better. So this talk, I will try to give you some very simple physical ideas without, of course, any formalism and any calculations. I would like to start by remembering, by reminding us what quantum physics is about. In fact, the theory of quantum physics has started about a hundred years ago, a little bit more than that, by a paper by Einstein in 1905, which showed that light waves, light which was considered to be a wave, giving rise to interference phenomena, was also made of discrete particles, which were later called photons. So, Einstein introduced the quantization principle in physics, the fact that waves can have also a discrete character in physics at that time. A few years later, a young physicist, Niels Bohr, uh, applied the concept of quantization also to matter. At that time, it had been discovered that atoms were made of a positive charge, a nucleus around which electrons were uh, uh, turning around, and uh, what Bohr found out is that uh, the orbits of the electron were, could not be any orbit. They had to be to obey some quantization law, only discrete orbits which uh, could take discrete values of the diameter were allowed. And uh, when the atom was emitting or absorbing light, the electron was jumping between one orbit and the other undergoing what has been since, no, since then known as a quantum jump and absorbing or emitting a quantum of light, a photon, at that time. So Bohr was able to uh, gather the ideas of quantization for light and uh, for radiation into this model of the radiating atom. Ten years later, a French physicist, Louis de Broglie, added another element to this very strange theory by assuming that not only light was at the same time a wave and a particle, but material particles, which up to that time were considered to be discrete entities, were also associated to waves. So the wave-particle dualism extended from light to matter. And for instance, De Broglie said that the electron in an atom was a running wave going around the nucleus, and he was able to give a very interesting interpretation to Bohr's quantization. He said that the orbits which were allowed were the orbits for which an integral number of these wavelengths, which is called the De Broglie wavelengths, was accommodated around the circle. So, in fact, the quantization condition appears as a kind of resonance condition 
in the same way as a string, for instance, will be able to sustain, to vibrate at discrete frequencies for which you have an integral number of standing waves between the two fixed points of the string. So in this way, from step by step, uh, the, the, ve the veil which was hiding uh, the behavior of the microscopic world was lifted. This, this is a sentence that Einstein uh, wrote to one of his colleagues uh, saying that De Broglie's work has been lifting a part of this great veil. In fact, this lifting of the veil was, so to speak, completed in the 1920s by the work of three physicists, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Dirac, who independently derived the equations to which the microscopic particles obey. And these equations give a formal uh, interpretation to uh, the disparate ideas that Einstein, Bohr, and De Broglie had discovered independently. And the quantum theory was really born at that time because using these equations, it has become possible to calculate a lot of effects and to predict new phenomena occurring at the microscopic scale. In fact, this theory introduced at the heart of physics the wave-particle dualism. Wave and particles are the two sides of the same coin, so to speak, and this wave-particle dualism implies a superposition principle. If a particle is a wave, it means that the particle can be at different points at the same time, so to speak, superposed between these different states. And this superposition principle is very strange and striking because it destroys all the postulates on which classical physics was built. For instance, you cannot talk about trajectories anymore. If a particle is at a given time at different points in space, it doesn't have a well-defined trajectory, and this uh, leads to a lot of interesting phenomena. And in fact, all ideas about determinism, physical reality, were challenged by this new physics. But uh, the scientists have been forced to accept these ideas because this new physics has uh, proved to be very powerful to explain the world around us. It has given us the key of the microscopic world. Uh, this physics is absolutely necessary to understand the structure of atoms and molecules. In fact, electrons in atoms and molecules behave as waves, and it is the interference of these waves which explains the structure of the system. All chemistry is counted into quantum physics because chemistry uh, describes the interaction of atoms with each other, and these interactions are understood as an exchange of electrons obeying the laws of quantum physics. Even if you go at the macroscopic scale involving billions of atoms, the laws of quantum physics still apply, and in condensed matter physics, for instance, you need these laws of quantum physics to understand how electrons propagate in metals or, or in semiconductors, why some metals have, are superconducting, which means that they can carry electric currents without losses at low temperature. This, would not be, this could not be understood without these strange laws of the superposition principle. It also explains nuclear physics, particle physics, and even cosmology, if you want to understand what happens at the beginning of the universe, at a time where the density of matter and energy was incredibly large, just a few moments after the Big Bang, you have to invoke the laws of quantum physics to understand what was going on at that time. So this is fundamental physics, but at the same time, this knowledge has given us a lot of power to develop new technologies and to build new devices which have revolutionized our lives during the second part of the 20th century. I just quote here a few uh, devices, a few uh, uh, apparatuses which have changed our lives. The transistor and the computer could not have been developed if one didn't understand what was going on in uh, metals and semiconductors at the microscopic level. Lasers, too, are uh, fruits of quantum technology. Atomic clocks and the uh, global pos positioning system, the fact that we can locate ourselves on Earth with a precision of uh, one meter or even better is an application of the quantum laws. Magnetic resonance imaging, which allow us to see the inside of bodies with uh, very high precision for application in medicine and in research is also quantum technologies. I can go on and on, talk about the global communication network which uses lasers propagating in optical fibers. I can use, also describe all the application of superconducting materials. So it's really a very powerful theory, 
And at the same time, it's very strange because these laws are hard to understand in, a, in an intuitive way. I just give on the next slide uh, two examples of devices which have changed our lives and which are based on the quantum. Computers first. Uh, computers would be impossible without a transistor. The transistor is a device in which an electric current is commanded by a voltage. If the voltage is, uh, takes one value, the current flows. If the voltage takes another value, the current does not flow. And this uh, is called a, a logic gate. It gives, it's, a, it's a basic break for building computers by having these transi transistors interconnected. The first transistors, are, as you can see, were very big and cumbersome devices. But it has been possible to miniaturize them now and to imprint millions of transistors on a, on a small uh, silicon wafer by using techniques of uh, uh, lithography, by, in, by tracing a labyrinth of uh, circuit lines at a very small scale. And now you have chips which are integrated with, uh, within the computers and which give a huge power, uh, memory storage and computation powers to these small machines. And this would have been impossible bef be before uh, the quantum theory. The other example is a laser. The laser is a new source of light which exists, has been existing for only 50 years, which uh, allows to uh, produce light beams which are very well collimated, which have a very well-defined frequency and which can be very powerful. And these lasers are based on the properties of stimulated emission by light, by atoms, uh, which were discovered in uh, a theoretical paper uh, of Einstein in 1917. The fact that if a photon comes on an atom, the atom, and if the atom is excited, this atom has a propensity to emit a second photon exactly in the same beam. It's called light amplification, and it is a process which, uh, which is at the heart of lasers. And lasers, of course, have had a lot of applications in everyday life and in research, as we will see in a moment. And this would have been impossible uh, without uh, the uh, our knowledge of the quantum world. So why and how is the theory strange? As I said, quantum physics is based on the duality between wave and particle. And in order to illustrate this duality, I like to show this uh, uh, sentence, which is called an ambigram, because if you try to read it, and this, is, this works better in English than in French, if you, if you try to read it, depending upon your state of mind, you will read light is a wave or light is a particle. And this ambiguity, which is a psychological ambiguity, is in fact uh, translates, symbolizes the ambiguity in the, physic in the physical world. Light is a wave and an ensemble of photons. We have learned that from Einstein. And atoms are particle and matter waves at the same time. And we learned that from De Broglie. And this is, of course, impossible to understand by classical arguments which aspect is observed, in fact, depends upon the way we perform the experiment. If we ask nature, are you a wave or are you a particle, to get, to get an answer to this question, you have to build an experimental setup which will, by the result of an experiment, give the answer. And depending upon the setup you are using, nature will answer, I am, for the system, I am a wave or I am a particle. This is what Bohr called the principle of complementarity. The wave and particle aspects of reality are not contradictory, they are in fact complementary. So I'll try to give you a few examples which illustrate this idea. The, the simplest experiment which uh, shows this dualism between the particle and light aspect is a very well-known experiment for, by physicists. It's called the Young Double Slit Experiment. Its principle is very simple. You see, you have a source of light, a small yellow uh, point that you see on the left, and this source emits particles, photons, and it emits photons one by one. It's a very faint source of light, and the photons go through the setup one after the other. And they cross a screen which has two slits in it, so they have to cross the slit through one slit or the other, and then you collect these photons on a second screen. And what you see is a pattern of bright and dark fringes, uh, uh, lines on which the photons arrive and lines in between in which the photons never arrive. And you will see a real experiment which is performed in this way. 
and you will see that each photon arrives on the screen as a bright spot. And at the beginning, you have the feeling that the spots arrive randomly, but after many, many photons have been received, you see that the pattern emerges, and you see that the, the photons arrive at, on bright fringes and never arrive on dark fringes. Now, this experiment had been known for many, many years, and it was uh, an experiment showing that light was a wave. In fact, these patterns of fringes is uh, very easy to understand if you assume that it's a wave which crosses the two slits, and the wavelets going from one slit or the other interfere constructively or destructively depending upon the path difference from the slits to the screen. And this is really uh, a textbook experiment showing that light is a wave. But how can you interpret this experiment if the particles are crossing the system one by one? How do the photons arrive only on a bright fringe if they pass one by one through one slit or the other? How can they know, uh, and of course it's, when I say no, it's just a way of speaking, whether the other uh, slit is open or closed to decide whether they have the right to fall on the, on the dark fringe or not? In fact, if you want to understand this experiment, you have to assume in one way or the other that each photon must pass through both holes at once because this is the only way an interference could occur and decide whether the photon has a probability to uh, come on one point or not. And so this uh, precludes the existence of a classical trajectory for the photon in this experiment and this, in, this involves the superposition principle. And this will be the only equation I will write. The state of the photon is a superposition of the state corresponding to the photon passing through the slit X and the state of the photon passing through the slit Y. This superposition principle applies also for matter. Electrons, atoms, molecules are also waves and particles, as I just said, and the superposition principle should apply to them. And if you go to large systems made of a large number of particles and apply the same principle, you come immediately into the schrodinger cat paradox. You should be able to build system which will be at, different, at the same time in two different places or in two different states, and this is the story of Schrodinger's cat, and I will come back to it in a moment. So how do you uh, make sense of this and uh, uh, within, within the principle, the complementarity principles that I just discussed. Einstein and Bohr discussed this idea at length in, in the famous Solvay meetings which took place in the year 1920s. And you see here on the left a young double slit experiment which was slightly modified because Einstein tried to modify the experiment in such a way that one would be able to tell through which slit the particle went. That is, Einstein tried to design the experiment so that you can find the trajectory. And what Bohr showed to Einstein is that if you can find the trajectory, it means that you have modified the setup in such a way that you will not see the fringes. So what did Einstein propose? Einstein said to find the path, I will assume that the upper slit, as you can see in this picture, the upper slit is movable. It can go up and down, and it is suspended on a string. On a, on, on and springs. If the particle is going through the upper slit, it will be scattered on the edge of the slit and the slit will recoil. The slit will exchange momentum with the particle and if the slit recoils, it means that the slit will start moving up and down, start to oscillate. So if the slit oscillates, it means that the particle went through the upper slit. And in this way, we will find out the trajectory. So will we see fringes? If we do this experiment with many, many photons, will we see the building up of the fringe pattern if we have modified the setup in this way? And Bohr answered immediately that it would not be the case. And his argument is very simple. If you want to use this experiment to find out whether the particle went through the upper slit, it means that you have to define the initial momentum of this upper slit very well. So the uncertainty, the error, delta P, on the momentum of the slit should be very small. But then, according to quantum physics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that if delta P is very small, delta X will be large. The uncertainty in the position of the slit will be large. This is because delta X and delta P are related by the relation that I have written here. Delta X, delta P is larger than the Planck's constant H. This means that if you 
perform the experiment in this way, the position of the slit at the beginning will be fluctuating. It's called the zero point fluctuation of the oscillator. And this fluctuation will be large enough to blur the pass difference between the two passes and will destroy the fringes. So what Bohr showed to Einstein is that within quantum physics, there was a consistency. If you want to see the trajectory, you have to modify the setup in such a way that you will not be able to see the wave aspect anymore. This experiment is interesting also because it, it introduces implicitly in physics the concept of entanglement, which plays a very important role in, in quantum physics nowadays. You see that the particle which is crossing the, the, the experiment here is in a superposition of two states. It is a superposition of the state in which the particle crosses the upper slit and the state in which the particle crosses the lower slit. But the particle is not alone here. The particle interacts with the slit. And you see that if the particle crosses the upper slit, the upper slit moves. Whereas if the particle crosses the lower slit, the upper slit does not move. And you see now that the state of the combined system, particle plus slit, is now what we call an entangled slit. It cannot be factored. It cannot be considered as the product of a state describing the particle and a state describing the slit. It, now, you can, if you want to define the system, you have to use a global description which involves the particle and the slit in a way which is called entangled, which means that the particle and the slit have lost their quantum identity. It's only the combined system which has an identity. And this is because of this entanglement that the, the, the interference is lost. And in fact, what I want to stress is that this looks like a Schrodinger cat already. You see that the slit is a big system. It's made of a lot of atoms. And this slit is, in this experiment, prepared in a superposition of being at the same time motionless and oscillating. So the slit is in a superposition of two states which classically are incompatible. And this is exactly the same story that Schrodinger uh, described in his tale about Schrodinger's cat. In 1935, Schrodinger tried to develop this idea at a microscopic scale, and he imagined a story in which you would have in a box a single atom, and this atom would be put in a superposition of being excited and non-excited at the same time. And if the atom is excited, nothing happens to the cat, if the atom goes to the lower state, it emits a particle which triggers a device which kills the cat. Now, if now the atom is in a superposition of being excited and not excited, which happens in the quantum world, then we cannot escape the conclusion that the cat should be in a superposition of being alive, associated to the excited state of the atom, and dead, associated to the de-excited state of the atom at the same time. And this is, again, an entangled state. So what Schrodinger pointed out is that quantum physics contains a logic which, by coupling a small quantum system to a large one, should export, so to speak, the strangeness of the quantum world from the micro world to the macro world and produce very strange, bizarre system in which a large system could be in a superposition of two states. And this is, of course, related also to the concept of entanglement. But you see that nobody has never seen a cat being at the same time dead and alive, so this raises the question of the boundary between the quantum and the classical. Why is, are these strange quantum effects veiled, suppressed, or hidden when you go from the micro world to the macro world made of a very large number of particles? So at this stage, I will summarize these ideas with next two transparencies very quickly. Uh, we learned that uh, Superposition of states exists in quantum physics. For instance, a particle which crosses a two-slit system will be at the same time on the left and on the right. But you have also superposition in other systems. Assume an atom which can be in two energy states, the electron being on the blue orbit or on the larger red orbit. You can have this atom at the same time in a superposition of these two states. And for that, what you have to do is to send a pulse of light which excites midway the system between the ground and the excited state, and you prepare this kind of state superpositions. And this superposition will give rise to interferences as long as you don't try to find out in which state the system is. 
what does it mean to try to find out where the system is? If you try to, find, to ask this question, you perform what is known as a measurement. For instance, you want to measure the position of the particle. But to measure, you have to perturb. If you want to measure the position of the particle, you have to shine light on it. If you want to see something, of course, you cannot see in the dark. So you need a lamp or a laser which will shine light on your system. And by shining light, photons will perturb the system. And the measurement will be obtained when some photons will be scattered into your eye or into a measuring device. But what quantum physics tells us is that when you perform this measurement, you destroy the superposition. The particle will collapse in one state or in the other. And it happens, so you will see the particle here or there. And this collapse occurs randomly. There is no way you can predict ahead of time whether you will find the particle on the left or on the right. So quantum physics destroys superposition when you perform measurement, and it destroys the superposition in a random way. And this randomness is really at the heart of quantum physics. It has been discovered at that time by the father of the theory, and some people did not like it at all. Einstein said that he cannot believe that God is playing dice with the world, and Bohr used to answer to him, who are you to tell God what he should do? And, what we, and in fact, what we have learned during the last century is that, uh, so to speak, God is indeed playing dice with nature because all quantum phenomena are, in a sense, random. The only thing we can predict is the probability that an event will occur. What happens now to uh, destroy this quantum superposition in the macroscopic world, the phenomenon is called decoherence. Again, I consider now a big system. Suppose that instead of atoms, you have billiard balls, which are very large, made of a very large number of atoms. Can you ever see a billiard ball crossing two holes in a superposition state? This sounds very bizarre, and of course, you never see that. And why it is so? It's due to the fact that when systems are large, they are necessarily coupled to an environment. For instance, these balls will be bouncing with a lot of air molecules around them. And there will be a lot of thermal photons around the system. In the case of the Schrodinger cat, it's obvious for the cat to be alive in the first place. It has to interact with molecules of oxygen. It has to interact with black body photons, which keep it warm and, and alive. And so you always have an environment. And this environment, is in fact measuring the system. And the coupling with the environment collapses the system randomly on the left or on the right, but the system is no longer in a superposition of the two states. So to make the long story short, we can say that the environment performs a kind of measurement which destroys the superposition in large system. And this explains, and this happens faster and faster when the system becomes larger and larger. And this explains why the macro world appears classical, because we see the end result of this decoherence process in the world which surrounds us. Okay, all this has been discovered step by step by uh, the fathers of quantum theory at a time where they were only able to imagine these experiments. But during the last 20 years, these experiments, these thought experiments, have become possible, have become real in the laboratory. And this is because of the development of new technologies. Tunable lasers are essential. You need lasers to manipulate atoms. With sending laser beams on atoms, you can prepare atoms in superposition state. You can push the atoms, cool them down, change their velocities. And this has been a very important part of modern atomic physics. You need also fast computers in order to uh, store the information that these atoms are giving us if you want to be able to react back on the system uh, at a very fast uh, 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 time scale. And also, for some experiments, you need new materials, superconductors, which will allow photons to bounce between mirrors without being absorbed for a very long time. And all these technologies which we are using in these experiments are quantum technologies. So you see that we have a kind of virtuous circle. Uh, the, Quantum physics has allowed us to develop the technologies which now make it possible to control the particles one by one in real experiments. 
So this was the uh, field of research which has been recognized by last year's Nobel Prize, which, as has been uh, said previously, I shared with my friend uh, David Wyman. So we are controlling the particle and qu quantum particles, observing them without destroying them. And in fact, our experiments can be considered as the two sides of the same coin. In, in Boulder, Dave Wenland is manipulating non-destructively single atoms with photons. You see he uh, uh, builds uh, ion traps, uh, a configuration of electrodes which create electric and magnetic fields which can keep charged atom ions at a well-defined position in space. You see them as a small balls in the, in the middle. And he used lasers to manipulate these atoms, to cool them down, and to observe them by the light they scatter. And in Paris, we do the opposite. We trap photons between mirrors, and we use a beam of atoms crossing uh, this box, this cavity, to extract, to manipulate the, the, the photons, and to extract information from them. And in both cases, we perform what we like to call in vivo physics. The particles are still there. We see them, and we react back on them, and we observe how they evolve in, in our experimental setup. And in both cases, we have to understand light-matter interaction at the most fundamental level. That is, how a single atom interacts with a single photon emitting or absorbing it, according to the laws of quantum physics. So I will give you only one example of the kind of experiments that uh, ion trappers are doing. You see here five beryllium ions in the lab of Dave Wynand. You see each of these, these ions are suspended between these electrodes. You see the, uh, the yellow uh, boxes on top and below are the electrodes. The, si the scale is given here. It's only 0.2 millimeter across. And you see each ion is a bright spot. Why? Because laser beams irradiate the atoms and each atom can scatter millions of photons per second. And you just collect these photons with a small microscope, and you can see them almost with a naked eye. Each atom appears as a very bright spot. And here you have only five of them. Since then, the experiment has been developed in other labs. You see here in, in the lab in Innsbruck, 14 calcium ions, and here 30 calcium ions on a line. Each of these ions can be manipulated individually, and these ions can be entangled with each other, and a lot of simple manipulations can be performed. And you can think of this as a kind of atomic abacus, which can store information and manipulate information. And this is a field which is developing very fast now called quantum information that I don't have time to discuss in detail, but this is performed with, with this kind of ions. In Paris, we do the opposite, as I said. So we have two mirrors. And you see these mirrors are made of uh, very shiny. They are made of copper, and the copper is machined so to avoid all kinds of roughness. And on top of this copper, we sputter a thin layer of niobium. And niobium is a superconductor material, which at low temperature does not absorb photons at all. So we get very, very bright mirrors. And we send single atoms one by one across these mirrors. A few uh, figures about these mirrors, uh, light can bounce more than a billion times between these mirrors before being lost. And this is a very high reflectivity. You know that this structure of two mirrors facing each other is found in many uh, uh, devices of everyday life. For instance, if you get into an elevator, very often you have two mirrors facing each other, and <clears throat> you see your reflection in these mirrors and you see maybe 20 or 30 or 40 reflections, but not more than that, because the mirrors are not perfect. Here, if you went in an elevator between the two mirrors that I show you here, you would see more than one billion reflections of yourself in the mirrors. That is, the whole population of China uh, uh, represented here. So it gives you an idea how, how good these mirrors are. The, the time it takes for the light to bounce back and forth is more than a tenth of a second and the light propagates over 40,000 kilometers during this time. And then the atoms are crossing this box one by one, and you see this is the kind of experiment we are doing, and after the atoms have crossed, we destroy the atoms to get information about the light which was stored between the mirrors. But so you see that the, the tools that we are using to perform these experiments are atom, atoms. We use atoms to get information about light, but these are not ordinary atoms. They are called circular Rydberg atoms. 
and they, these are the atoms that Bohr described in his own theory of quanta. And in fact, they behave as atomic clocks. And I will try on this slide to give you at least a flavor of why it is so. So we start with an atom in its ground state. And you know that in the ground state, the electron orbits on a very small uh, orbit, which is of the order of one-tenth of a billionth of, of, of a meter. And then using lasers and radio frequency fields, we promote an electron on a very large orbit. You see here, this is an orbit which has a radius of one-tenth of, of a micrometer. So at an atomic scale, it's 1,000 times larger than the ground state uh, orbit size. And we need, it's a rather complex preparation which requires lasers and circularly polarized radio frequency photons to, to feed angular momentum to make the electron going on a circle. According to De Broglie, as I said, it's, it's a standing wave which has 51 wavelengths around the circle. And this standing wave, in this standing wave, the electron is completely delocalized. It can be anywhere on the circle. In our experiment, we want to have a direction, to give a direction to this electron. And for that, we prepare a superposition of the electron being in the state which has 51 uh, nodes in the De Broglie wave function and the state which has only 50 nodes. And these two waves interfere, as waves do, and they interfere constructively on one side of the orbit and destructively on the other side. And this gives rise now to a wave packet. The electron is more on one side than the other. And this wave packet rotates at the frequency of 50 gigahertz around the nucleus. So this localized wave packet revolves around the nucleus like a planet around the sun. This is a model that Bohr had described, but it's a quantized orbit. And it can also be considered as the hand of a clock on a dial. And in fact, by counting the speed, by counting the number of evolutions that this uh, electron is doing per second, we build the clock. We can measure the time by counting the number of evolutions during the time interval. This is called an atomic clock. But this is a very special atomic clock which is sensitive to the photons. If these atoms are crossing cavity containing photons, the clock is delayed by the photons stored between the mirrors. And by measuring the delay of this clock, we can count the photons. And the clock setup is shown here. You see, in the center, you have the cavity which contains the field that we want to measure. On the left side, the box B uh, is The box B here is a box in which the circular states are prepared. And these circular atoms are crossing the apparatus one by one. And then they are detected here. And we measure the quantum state, E or G, which means that we have a binary information for each atom. Each atom gives you a binary information that is detected in one state or in the other. And we have, there are two very important ingredients in this experiment. These are the two cavities, R1 and R2 which are sandwiching the cavity which contains the photon. In R1, a pulse of microwave prepares a superposition of the quantum state E and G. That is, it gives the initial direction to this wave packet, to this, wave, to this electronic wave packet. Then this packet is, is revolving as the atom crosses the cavity. And a second flash of microwave is applied downstream to measure what is the direction of this electron wave packet after it has crossed the cavity. Now, this device, which involves two separated microwave pulses, one after the other, is called a Ramsey interferometer. An atom is subjected to two pulses, and in the end, one measures the probability for the atom to end up in one state or the other. And it looks very much as a young double slit experiment, except that instead of having two slits in space, we have two pulses in time. And indeed, when you measure the probability to find the atom in one state or in the other as a function of the frequencies that you apply in the microwave zone, you see fringes which look very much like the young double slit fringes. I show you here the fringes that you see if there is zero photon inside the cavity, and in red, the fringes that you would see if there is one photon. You see that the photon is delaying the clock and shifting the fringes. And if you tune your device at the maximum of the fringe 
when there is one photon, you are at the minimum of the fringe if there is zero photon, which means that the atom will exit the cavity in one, will exit the system in one state if there is zero photon, and in the other state if there is one photon. And this looks like the young double slit apparatus. So you see that we are using quantum interference to count photons in our cavity. And you see here the result. A red bar means that the atom is detected in level E, and a blue bar in level G. And you see, we see these kind of traces, which show that suddenly, at a given time, a quantum jump occurs. A photon enters the cavity. This photon is produced by thermal fluctuations. We are at very low temperature, but still the temperature is not absolutely zero, so we have small fluctuations in the mirrors, which sometimes make one photon pop in the cavity. The photon stays for a while and then disappears, as you can see here. And you see also that hundreds of atoms see the same photon, so it's really non-destructive. So this gives you an idea of what we do to keep, to measure photons without destroying them. What I want now, and in, in what I have said up to now, is to emphasize the particle aspect of light. I'm counting photons, zero or one, and I can count more photons if I wanted. But now I would like to emphasize the wave aspect of light and to describe an experiment which shows that we can use this wave aspect to build Schrodinger cat states of light. So for that, I have to describe you what is a light field which has a well-defined phase. A light field which has a well-defined phase is an oscillation which oscillates in time going up and down. The electric field or the magnetic field is doing that. And there are two important parameters for a light field. It's amplitude, the, 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 the distance between the crest and the throw of, of the wave, and also its phase, which tells us when the field reaches its maximum. You see here three fields which have the same amplitude, but which are 120 degrees out of phase with respect to each other. Now, engineers like to describe such, a, such a oscillation by a vector in an abstract space, which is called the phase space of the Fresnel plane. And you see that the three fields I have shown here are represented by three vectors in different directions. The length of the vector gives the amplitude of the field and the direction of the vector of the phase. In quantum physics, this picture can be generalized easily. And a, class, a, a field which has a well-defined phase, a quantum field, will be a vector with a fuzzy tip. The end of the tip will be uh, in, in an uncertainty uh, region of the phase space because you must have some uncertainty in the photon number and uncertainty in the phase according to Heisenberg uncertainty relations. So you have to modify slightly the classical description to allow for this fuzziness. And in fact, uh, these quantum states are represented by a distribution of points in phase space that for the tip of the vector who have a Gaussian shape, a bell-shaped curve and this is the best description we can give of a classical field. And it is called a Wigner function. It is shown here in false colors. So the question is, how, what happens when such a coherent field interacts with a single atom? And, I ju and again, the Ramsey interferometer will be useful. We start by injecting a small coherent field in the cavity, which is shown here with this vector tip. And then we send a single atom across the cavity. And before the atom enters, we prepare it in R1 in a state superposition. This state superposition crosses the cavity. And after the atom has emerged, depending upon whether the atom is in one state or in the other, the phase of the field will be shifted in one direction or in the other. This effect is called an index effect. And it is something which you can understand classically. But here, the quantumness comes from the fact that we can prepare this index medium in a superposition of having two different values at once. You see that if you detect the atom, the, the atom at this point, you will collapse the field with this phase or that phase, and you will get again a coherent state. But you can do something more clever. You can mix, you can let the atom cross the second Ramsey zone, which mixes the states again. And after that, you are no longer able to tell what was the state of the atom when it crossed the cavity. When you detect the atom and you find it in one state or in the other, you have an ambiguity about the state, the trajectory of the atom when it crossed the cavity. And by the fact that you no longer have the information 
about the state of the atom when it crosses the cavity, you project the field into a superposition of having the two phases at once. This is called a Schrodinger cat. So detecting the atom projects the field into a cat state superposition. And we can measure these superpositions. In fact, I don't have time to describe it, but we can reconstruct the Wigner function of this cat state. This is an experimental signal. And you see the two Gaussian peaks at right and left, which you can say represent the live and dead cat. So you see that you have at the same time a field in two states, symbolized by this dead and live cat. And in between, you see fringes in the Wigner function, which take positive and negative value. The blue, blue color corresponds to a negative value. And these interferences show that you are indeed in a superposition of the two states. And you can do even more than that. You can take snapshots of this Wigner function as a function of time. You see here the time scale, one millisecond. And you see that the fringes will vanish if you let this system in the cavity for some time. After a time which would be here of the order of 20 milliseconds, the fringes have disappeared, and you have gone from the quantum to the classical world. You have transformed the state superposition into a mixture of a state in which the cat is dead or alive. So we have been able to check the theory of decoherence, which was uh, described first in details by uh, a theorist, Wojciech Zurek, back in the 1980s. And we have been able to check also that the decoherence rate increases with the cat size, which gives an illustration of the quantum to classical boundary. So I think I've spent a lot of time already, and my time is up. I would like to conclude by a few remarks. Why is it important to be able to manipulate single quantum particles? Of course, the first answer is just blue sky research, curiosity. Is it possible? What do we have to do to do that? How does nature behave at this level? And in fact, the fact that it is possible has not been so obvious. As uh, in 1952, Schrodinger wrote this sentence saying, we never experiment with single electrons, atoms, or small molecules. In thought experiments, we assume that we do, and it always results in ridiculous consequences. So you see that it was not obvious, and it has taken a lot of efforts and a lot of new technologies to be able to do these experiments. But when you do it, what do you learn, and what, why is it useful? The first remark I can make is that small systems react faster and pack more information per unit volume than large ones. So if you can, you are able to manipulate single atoms and to, and to uh, make systems made of single atoms or single particles bigger and bigger, you will be able to store a lot of information. And this is what, uh, compute, what the t technology of computers is doing. We are packing more and more transistors in smaller and smaller volumes, and this makes the power of computer increase exponentially, and this is called Moore's law. But we are now reaching the point where a single transistor will have the size of an atom, and then the quantum laws will become dominant, and we will be able to use the quantum logic to increase still more the power of computers. Why? Because quantum physics makes a wide range of new states accessible, not only the dead and live cat, but all kinds of superposition between dead and live cats, between atoms in different states. And this allows us to store more and more information, even more information than just the, the mere geometric increase due to the decrease in size of the systems. So we can think of more powerful computers, quantum logic at work, more secret communication, it's called quantum cryptography, and more precise measurements. And here I just want to say a few words about one uh, outcome of Dave Wineland's research, by, by manipulating single ions uh, in traps, he has been able to build an atomic clock which has a sensitivity and a precision which is absolutely extraordinary. It's a, two clocks of this kind, if they were prepared, if they were started at, at the origin of the universe, will not deviate from each other than more than a few seconds in 14 billion years. So it gives you an idea of the precision of these atomic clocks, which have a potential for more precise global positioning systems and maybe for geophysics applications, because the time that this clock gives depends upon the height in which it is in the gravitational field of the Earth because of the general relativity of Einstein. And by moving this clock and looking at the small deviation of the time given by the clock, you could learn a lot about the distribution of masses inside the Earth, and this can have a lot of potential practical applications. 
you could think also uh, of a quantum computer. It would be a Schrodinger cat, a uh, huge Schrodinger cat, uh, which would be able to compute faster. In fact, the idea is to exploit state superposition and entanglement in an ensemble of real artificial atoms and having this kind of computer compute on several trajectories and doing several computation in parallel using quantum superposition. And there is a lot of research being done in this direction to improve the power of computers. But of course, decoherence is a big challenge. You have to avoid decoherence in large systems. And the ways to correct for it are investigated. Experiments are performed with very small ensemble of atoms, but we are far from having a big computer yet. More promising is to build quantum simulators to uh, arrange a lattice of atoms or a string of atoms and simulate with the system what happens in real condensed matter systems at the microscopic scale. And you know, if you have atoms in a lattice and if you have more than 50 or 100 atoms, you have a Schrodinger equation, but you don't know how to solve it because the classical computers are not powerful enough. But if you can realize the system in the lab, do the experiment at a different scale because you are now able to put atoms at, uh, at distances of a few micrometers and arrange them in the same way as they are arranged in real materials at the nanos nanoscale, then you are able to force, you force the system to behave in the same way as the real system does. And with this kind of analogous system, you can understand what happens in real systems. It's called simulators, and it might help us to understand better and better what happens in, in, uh, in complex materials. So uh, if, if I am asked what would be the use of all this, I like uh, to uh, recall this sentence, which is, has been attributed to this board, but uh, to a lot of people too, that it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But I am sure of one thing. If we don't do basic research, blue sky research driven by pure curiosity, novel technologies will never be invented because they are all based on this uh, uh, on, on the substrate of basic research, which tells us how, how nature works. And I want to say also that the past teaches us that a lot of wonderful applications have emerged from blue sky research without the inventors of the initial research knowing where it would lead to. And I will give you only one example, which is uh, very popular, magnetic resonance imaging. The fact that you can make images of the inside of your body and, fantastically precise images. This, this relies on magnetic resonance. The fact that the uh, hydrogen atoms in our body have small magnets, and these magnets precess in a magnetic field. It's called magnetic resonance, and it was discovered in 1946 by people uh, which, who did not know at all that one day it would be used in MRI machines. Why? Because in order for this spin to precess at a fast pace, you need a big magnetic field. And big magnetic fields are produced by big magnets, which did not exist at that time, and which are made with superconducting coils in which a huge current is running. These coils are now produced by the industry, and uh, you have in, in hospitals this kind of big cryostats, which did not exist in 1946. You put the patient inside this coil. All his hydrogen atoms are revolving. They produce signals which are detected by coils. And these signals have to be transformed into images. And for that, you did computers, of course, which did not exist in 1946. And if you put all these technologies together, you are able to see what happens inside your brain, for instance. You see here, when someone is thinking, some points in the brain are lighting. What happens? It means that what happens is that when you think about doing something, the part of the brain which is involved has an increased flux of, of blood. The blood carries uh, hemoglobin, which carries iron, and this iron modifies the magnetic field in, in that vicinity. This changes the, the nature of, of the magnetic resonance signals, and the computers can unravel all this and tell you which part of the brain is thinking. So you can reveal the dynamical work of the brain in real time, and this has, of course, huge application in medicine and in neurobiology. And I want to say that all this comes from quantum physics and from basic research. So I will conclude by saying that novel technologies 
often come in a serendipitous way from blue sky research, and blue sky research needs two priceless ingredients, time and trust. All these experiments need to be developed over a very long time scale with people who stay together and are able to, to build up a lab and build up an expertise over a very long time. I was able to do that in Paris, and Dave went and was able to do that in Boulder in Colorado. And I must say that research is fully successful where and when these two ingredients are present. And I am a little bit sad to realize that this uh, combination is not really favored by the laws of the global market, which emphasizes speed and fast obtained marketable results. If you ask now someone to build a quantum computer in two or three years, it's ridiculous. It is as ridiculous as asking to uh, people in 1946 that they want to have an MRI machine by 1949. And uh, this is uh, unfortunately a little bit the way modern research is working. And I will conclude by acknowledging the fact that I have been lucky, a place where research driven by pure curiosity has thrived during the last 50 years is the laboratory uh, of the Kastler Brossel Laboratory at Ecole Normale Supérieure, where I have been working during all these years. And I'd like to show the picture on the right, which was taken in 1966. I was a graduate student, I am here, at the time where uh, the Nobel Prize of uh, Alfred Kastler was announced. You see here, Alfred Kastler was a builder of the lab with Jean Brossel and discovered optical pumping. And the student of Alfred Kastler was Claude Cohen Tanuji on the left, who was my own thesis advisor. So you see that there is a long legacy in this laboratory. And uh, I think it, to, to get a Nobel Prize, it helps if your mentor had one. And this is, <laughs> this is true for me, and it is also true for Dave Wyman because his advisor was Norman Ramsey, which I quoted before. So you see that this is something which is helpful. But it's not only necessary to have a good mentor, it's also absolutely necessary to have good colleagues and good students. And I want to acknowledge especially uh, my collaboration with Michel Boyne and Jean-Michel Raymond, who stand on the left of this picture. And I have been working with them for the last 30 years, 25 to 30 years. And all this research would have been impossible without, without them. And of course, without all the postdocs and visitors and students who have shared the excitement of this research over this long period of time. And I will stop here and thank you.